Welcome to the Attention Deficit Disorder Expert Podcast Series by Attitude Magazine. Good afternoon, everyone. It's Susan Coffin for Attitude Magazine. We're very lucky to have today Judith Kohlberg. Judith Kohlberg is a groundbreaking thinker in the field of organization, especially for those of us who are chronically disorganized. She uh, has published a number of books. I'll cite two of them. One, ADD Friendly Ways to Organize Your Life, co-authored with Dr. Kathleen Nadeau, was a finalist in the Best Organizing Book category recently. It's a book that we recommend highly of attitude. She's also written a book called Conquering Chronic Disorganization, which I think is very apropos for those of us with ADHD. Dr. Kohlberg has written some articles for Attitude, which I recommend to you on our website, including one that's a big favorite for many of our readers called 33 Ways to Get Organized with Adult ADHD. Dr. Kohlberg has two websites, which I'll recommend to you. One is called fileheads.net, F-I-L-E-H-E-A-D-S.net, which is the place to go if you're looking to find an organizer to help you. It's a service website. And the second one is called squallpress.net, S-Q-U-A-L-L, press, P-R-E-S-S, dot net. And there you'll find references to her books and some other articles and tools that might be of interest to those of you with ADHD. Um, Judith Colbert is going to talk today about four topics, primarily about information overwhelm and how to manage it, about interruptions and distractibility, about to-do lists and how to get things done. And finally, the big topic that I know many of you are interested in, which is clutter and stuff, paper, whatever it may be. So let's get started. Thank you very much, Judith Kohlberg. We're really grateful to you for joining us today. Thank you, and thank you so much for the promotion to Dr. Kohlberg. I like the sound of that. Even though uh, I'm not sorry, is that not right? <laughs> well, it's fine with me, but it is uh, okay. <laughs> probably illegal. <laughs> So this uh, <laughs> presentation is called ADD Friendly Ways to Organ your, Organize Your Life in the Era of Endless. We live in the era of endless, so we're confronted by infinite information and incessant interruptions, constant distractions and unending work and boundless stuff and all this endlessness, right, butts up against the one thing that remains intractably finite, which is time. So there are challenges for getting organized in this ADD-ish era of endless for everyone, including ADD adults, but there are also some ADD strengths that can be used to your advantage in the era of endless. A game changer for everybody is endless information. I mean, there's no end with the internet to the information that can be found to solve a problem or satisfy a curiosity or research a topic. And um, ADDers are particularly vulnerable to the stimulation of the information hunt and to the excitement of finding new things on the web. So in the era of endless information, we need new stopping points. Now let me give you an example. My ADD client was dedicating as much research to the summer camp for her kids as to how to get the grass stains out of their jeans. And because either one of these problems could make her go on and on and on forever looking for information, she's learning to stop. So she's stopping sooner with low consequence items like grass stains and she's dedicating a little bit more time for higher consequence informational pursuits like a summer camp. So this matter of proportionality becomes really, really important when information is endless. It's also important to develop yourself as a great pointer. And I'll tell you what I mean by that. My client Ruth writes a 300 word blog about ADD medication. So she blogs the most salient information and then she points people to great websites, to other blogs, to webinars for more information. So in the era of endless information, it's really important to cultivate yourself not as somebody who's going to find every comprehensive little bit of information because you'll go crazy and you'll uh, dedicate so much time to that you won't have time for anything else, but become a better pointer. Information capture. In the era of endless, there is nonstop 
incoming information, what I call missiles, and often it's called inundation. So capturing information becomes more important than ever. Now my ADD clients have been capturing information on the go forever. Uh, and on this score, I believe that they're way ahead of my non-ADD clients. So we used to say all the time, write it down, write it down, write it down. And this is still true. But now, in the era of endless and technology, there are so many better ways to write things down, ADD-friendly ways to write things down besides, of course, writing on your hand, hello. And it's important because your working memory isn't as strong as it should be. So here are some suggestions for my ADD clients. Record it. If you get verbal information or little bits of advice or websites people throw at you or things that you want to remember, whatever, call it into your voicemail and leave yourself messages. You can use the recorder on your smartphone. You can also capture verbal information and convert it into text using a product like Jot.com, J-O-T-T.com. Now, all of the apps and websites and whatever I might reference to you are on your resource page. So don't worry too much about writing them down. You can also use voice to text conversion, such as an app like Instacorder. I mean, it's incredible, Instacorder. You push the record button, you make a voice message. When you release the button, the message is sent to your email. I mean, how cool is that? So it converts all that stuff that's in the air into something that you can wrap yourself around, which is text. You can also print out text messages if you need them. There's a couple of ways to do that. My favorite, um, which was recommended by an ADD client, is called treasuremytext.com. Now, no presentation on getting organized is ever complete without talking about distractibility. ADDers, again, are way ahead of the rest of us because they've been contending with endless distraction all their lives. So they kind of fit in a lot into this era of endless. Now here are a couple of distraction, ADD-friendly strategies that my clients are using that you might not be familiar with. Again, if you've ever taken a webinar on ADD before, if you've ever read a book, good as they are, there's always new ones, fresh ones, and in this case, ones that are more appropriate to the era of endless distraction. One of those is creating a meaning reservoir. Basically, it means finishing something early in the day. Finish, closure, begin something and end something early in the day, and that can give you meaning for the entire rest of the day. You can say that you at least you finished that thing. And I think this is good advice for ADDers because distractibility and executive function weaknesses you know, often leave you as an individual who never gets to really experience closure. So it's really important to build up these meaning reservoirs. Another thing you can do is close before you open. Don't read email first thing in the morning. Julie Morgenstern, who's an expert organizer, advises because email is an opener. It's not a closer. Close something, particularly early in the day, before you open. Finish something from the day before, and then open up your email. Grab an artifact. When you leave a room and you're distracted or you're taken off task, bring an artifact with you, an actual physical artifact. An unopened envelope can remind you that you were opening the mail before you got interrupted. A washcloth reminds you to return to folding laundry. If you have no actual object, a post-it note, even if it's blank, in your palm, will remind you to think to return to what you were doing before. Something physical really helps a lot when you're distracted. Endless work, okay? In the era of endless, we could work all day, every day, 24-7, and we could never finish what it is that we have on our plate, right? You still might necessarily never reach that clear space to relax, or that thing that we used to call downtime. Now why is that? This is important. Because productivity gains, you know, working smarter, not harder, you remember that, those gains are reinvested not into leisure, but into more work, 
right? The smarter we work, the more we find more time to do what? Not to relax, but to work some more. So work kind of is starting to feel endless, like there's no end to it. And what happens often is with ADDers, they start to procrastinate even more than before, or what I call procrastination. <laughs> there's a TV show called Raising Hope, and the young father in the show was lazing on the couch, and his mother yelled at him, get up and go get a job. Stop procrastinating. Now, my ADD clients don't procrastinate because they're lazy. They procrastinate to build up steam, to get some initiation and engagement going, something that they're weak on in their executive functioning. But procrastination means not only procrastinating, but kind of a little bit getting off on it. I'll give you an example. My client, Glenn, deliberately waits to start a boring project. He says, cutting a deadline close is a bit of a thrill for me. Well, that's fine, but the problem is that procrastination can be stressful. So I'd like to recommend a couple of other tactics. Invest yourself more in the outcome especially if what you're doing is boring. Let's say you're putting off cleaning out a closet, right? Spend a minute thinking of what you'll gain. Better yet, write the gains down. The money in all those handbags, right? The space to see what you actually own. The tax deduction for donating excess clothes to charity are all ways to invest yourself more in the outcome. Now, I'm told rewards can also be a way of kind of artificially investing yourself into something. But I'll tell you what, I've not been very successful with rewards with my clients. So if you can give me any feedback on your success with that, I'd really appreciate it. A good old organizing standby that helps when work is endless is to schedule tasks. Now let me tell you what I mean. Okay, we got the to-do list down, right? But you also have to associate getting things done, the things to do, with when to do them. So it's important not only to make this huge list of things to do, but to dump some of your to-do list right into your calendar. Because here's what we know as organizers, and only organizers would be fascinated with these statistics. If you make a to-do list, you got about a 40 to 50% chance of pulling it off. But if you schedule something as a task, it zooms up to 70% or more. Do different kinds of things in different kinds of places. It's an ADD-friendly way to optimize your focus and your attention in the era of endless work and endless distraction. Here's an example. My client, Marsha, long ago gave up doing her taxes at home. It was a setup for failure, right? So on April 1st through April 3rd, she checks into a local hotel. She hauls all her records into the room with her. She cozies up to her laptop. She spreads the stuff out on the bed, on the floor, on all the surfaces. She packs a lot of snacks. And she stays there for three days until her taxes are done. But she breaks. She breaks to rejuvenate, laps in the pool, and to go to the exercise room, and so forth and so on. But just changing her environment really made a big difference to her. Now, I know some ADDers go nuts in the quiet of the library, and they may be even more super productive at a place like Starbucks. Brainstorming a new marketing plan might require a different environment than a hotel room or a conference hall. You might need a lot of windows, a place to pace, a lot of space to put stuff up on the wall. Contrast that with entering your data into Quicken which might require a small, tight, quiet spot with no windows. Different tasks, different levels of focus. Now, this isn't on your slide, but I also want to talk to you about organizing your support. In the era of endless, it's more important than ever to organize your support team. Sari Solden says, expand your idea of organizational help to include other people to help you. You need to get over this obsession with being an organized person or trying to keep it together in the same way that non-ADD people do. I mean, a disorder, after all, means something is not of average difficulty and you might need more support. This is particularly important with clutter, with stuff, 
with endless stuff. So support might mean another set of hands, or it might mean someone to just keep your morale up, or it may mean someone to function as a passive body double. Now, a body double is somebody who's there, who actually doesn't do the organizing with you, but creates the environment that gives you the focus that says, oh, here's what I'm doing now. This is what I'm concentrating on. And your body double just creates that environment, kind of anchors you to the task at hand. Has to be somebody who's non-judgmental. You know, somebody who's not going to say, throw it all away. This could be, you know, an organizing buddy, an ADD coach, and of course I also recommend professional organizers. So those are some of the things that I'm recommending right now as part of my um, presentation, and I'd love to hear your questions. Great. Thank you so much, Judith, for that introduction. Um, let me start with a question from Cindy, who says, I have so much stuff to organize that I feel overwhelmed. I don't know where to begin. How do I put aside all the negative thoughts that I have and just begin without talking myself out of it? Well, one thing is to, you know, there's never the right time to start. <laughs> there just isn't. So you just do what you can when you can. And it also doesn't particularly matter where you start. Now, a lot of people get mixed up about this. You can start anywhere. You can start with the toughest spot. You can start with the easiest spot. The issue after that is continuing on to make sure that after you start, that then you have some kind of a logical order. So if you're starting on the left side of the room, then keep going to the left, 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 left in kind of a circle. If you're starting way up on the top with shelves, then come down. Have a process that's well ordered, but it doesn't matter where you start. It certainly doesn't matter when you start because no time is a good time. Is this the case that, that um, where the um, where Sydney would benefit from your notion of scheduling the task? Or, or Yeah, that couldn't hurt either. I mean, you know, it's going to loom on your to-do list. You know, clean out the closet, clean out the closet, clean out the garage, clean out the garage. You're just going to keep moving it over and moving it over to the next to-do list, next to-do list, next to-do list. But if you actually designate a time and maybe grab a body double, a buddy, a pizza, a Coke, and you start somewhere, anywhere, and you have a logical process, then you're really going to make much more progress. So it sounds like in terms of Cindy's question that, that sort of beating herself up and just keeping this task as an endless challenge is, is not going to ever end in its result. No. She needs some of the support that you're describing. Um, yeah, I think of, really having somebody do it with her is going to make all the difference in the world. Now, again, it matters who that person is. So you don't want somebody berating you during the whole process. But it can really right. change the whole dynamic to do this socially rather than in isolation. Very interesting. Uh, a question from Gerald. Can you recommend a calendar-based calendar application for to-do lists? Uh, uh, this person see. says he sees his, it, he sees, finds it helpful to see the to-do list in the context of the calendar, which is pretty much what you're recommending also. Yeah, there's one that um, a couple of clients have recommended me called Coolender, C-O-O-L-E-N-D-A-R, Coolender. And it's a calendar, you want a calendar that um, incorporates the to-do list, right, with some notion of a schedule or a calendar, and a little place with some extra space to just kind of throw in stuff that's sort of coming at, it, coming at you like missiles in the air, that can, you know, where you can capture things. And I'm told that Coolender is a good, uh, good one, and also people swear by Google Calendar. They seem to like that a real lot. They do, right. Do, many, do, do you think that in terms of apps, this is a question from Christine, it's best to try a number of them to see which one works for you? Yes, and you'd be amazed how quickly you'll know. I mean, really, you test out an app, and within, really, within minutes, you'll know whether this app is for you. There will be just an intuitive sense that you'll have about how easy it is, how facile it is, how visual it is, you know, whether it's got too many whistles and bells, whether it's overkill, you know, whether it's boring, you'll know all of that very quickly. Now, this is one way that ADD adults are different than ADD teens. They really don't know, so they're experimenting with everything. But an ADD adult can draw on a lot of wisdom that they already know about ADD. And you can make your pick pretty quickly. I wouldn't worry too much about it. Okay. 
Um, what about a system for staying organized? People have said, you know, I, I schedule it, I schedule the item, but then I ignore it. Well, there's a lot of reasons why an organizing system breaks down. One is um, sometimes it's really not even a breakdown. Sometimes the ADD or just needs, you know, a little bit more variety and they get bored with their own systems. <laughs> and so what you want to strive to do is to have a system that stays in place at least for three months. I'm just picking seasonally because, because if you break it down every month and revise it, you can go a little crazy. But three months is, is pretty good for any system to endure. And you may not have to rehaul it like all the way from the beginning. You might just have to tweak it. But it's not unusual at all for ADDers to revamp their systems a little bit more, um, you know, faster than other people do. The other thing I think that happens is that, you, you know, the hardest thing to do is to kind of say to yourself, well, what went wrong and what went right? And then to kind of change things given the answers to your own questions. And that's a case where, in fact, an ADD coach can be really, really, really very helpful because they're very system oriented. And they're going to be able to help you organically develop a system and then tweak it and also, you know, analyze in a way what went right, what went wrong when things aren't going well. And usually, like everybody else, the most important factor that we'll do in a system is that it's way too complicated. So keep it simple, you know what. Okay. Um, still, still on the topic of to-do lists, it, uh, <laughs> Kathleen says she has a difficulty prioritizing today's tasks versus future tasks. She's still looking for the perfect planner. How do, do you have any thoughts on prioritizing this giant to-do list? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, you just got to take a shot. So um, if, if you've got, if you can use one, twos, and threes, if that's too narrow, add a four. If you can use A, B, and C, if that's too narrow, add a D. If you can use colors, up to four colors is really a very good device for organizing the priorities of your to-do list. You know, they have the capability of, you know, you can put those items in in different colors. But don't use more than four colors because that'll also drive you crazy. The best ones, of course, are yellow, green, and red because we know what those mean emotionally. And the fourth color doesn't matter at all. <laughs> okay, so color code. <laughs> okay. um, what about the idea of having two to-do lists, one for today and then one for someday? Um, I like three better. I like, um, yeah, three, which is now, soon, and fact chance, you know, something <laughs> like that. So now being today and soon as, as soon as I can get to it. Or what. Yeah, and now could be this week, doesn't, or within the next two days. I like now to be within the next two days because it's a little rigid to make it just today. So now could be today and tomorrow, soon would be by the end of this week, and then later, parking lot or fat chance could be after that. Okay. Christine says I, she loves your idea of close before you open and the idea of a mini reservoir. Most of the time it's getting anything completed that's hard. Yes. Do you have any other tips in, in that vein, close before you open being quite appreciated? That's a good one. Uh, you know, I think it's also helpful, and I can't say whether this is more for ADD people. It tends to be my experience, although I don't have the science to tell you why. But it also helps to do the first three things that are worrying you and get that off your plate. In other words, that internal distraction of worry plays so much more on the ADD brain than it does on other people that, you know, even if you make that perfect to-do list and you prioritize it and you're all ready to go and you've got an idea what's going to build up your meaning reservoir, I tell you what, when you open up your computer in the morning or you sit down at your desk or you start your day with your family, do the one or two th things that will get this worry off your mind and that can also really be a breakthrough for you because, you know, it just clears your head for being able to do everything else. You don't have this gray cloud looming over you as this internal distraction. You know, distractions, after all, are not just external. They're terribly, terribly internal as well. But don't you often find that, at least I know I find, that the very things that make me the most anxious are the ones that drop to the bottom of the list? Mm-hmm. 
Uh, well, I'll give you a little uh, tip about that, which is if you do any part of it, it breaks the anxiety. Mm -hmm. you not, not totally. Yeah, if you just do something, like mm -hmm. say you have a report to do, and it's, you know, just really hard to initiate that, it's causing you a lot of anxiety. If you just, even if you just like start the footnotes or do a little research or speak to one expert or, you know, go to the, go to, onto the internet and go to a particular website and take a few notes, if you just break that inertia, it can really often help you propel, you know, to keep going. That reminds me of a tip that um, Nancy Rady once gave us for how to start exercising. She yeah. said, just make yourself the first day drive to the gym and drive yeah. home again. It was a great suggestion that anyone who didn't have ADD just shrugged and said, what? You know, but I yeah. we understood immediately what she was saying. Just start. Make a, make a yeah. start in, the, in that direction. Yeah, it's just it's it's really, blockage. if you have a, an image of it visually, it's just forward motion. Do right. something that puts one step in front of the other. And that's often a lot of, uh, you know, what can really carry you through. Um, on the topic of apps, we have a suggestion here from Sandy who said try P-E-A-T at www.brainaid.com for an Android app. So there's a free 30-day trial. Um, it also reschedules your tasks based on priorities, so she's recommending that. Can um, you say it again, the name of it again? P-E-A-T is what she's written, capital P-E-A-T, at brainaid.com. At brainaid. So um, getting back to distraction from Regina, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, who says, my problem is distraction. I sit down at my desk. I've got all the stuff to do. I've got the list. It's all prioritized. And then whack, I get hit with a dozen distractions. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, that's what it's all about here. Um, you need to, you can either do two things. You can either reduce the distractions or make the task that you want to complete more compelling. Or you can do both, right? So you keep trying to lower those distractions, but you also have to try to make what you want to get completed, what you want to be successful at, what you want to accomplish more compelling. So maybe that's rewards or maybe that's making it terribly, terribly in your face more. I have a lot of ADD clients who use digital sticky notes, right? They're, they're just like regular sticky notes, but you can size them, you can put alarms in them, you can stick them right up on your laptop computer, and obviously the physical sticky notes are really important too. Okay. And you want to keep reminding yourself of, again, of the gains that you're going to make when you finish this thing, when you accomplish this thing. Okay. If, Someone asked about my reference to, to close before you open. She didn't mm. follow what that meant, and she would love it if you would restate. Okay. Which so there's meant. different kinds of tasks, right? Different kinds of to-dos, different kinds of things that have to get done. Some of those things open up more work, and some of those things close work down. Finish it, complete it, provide closure, you know, wrap it up tidy, that kind of thing. So email, for instance... <laughs> is notorious for opening tasks up. As soon as you get into your email, there's going to be all this stuff to do that's new, right? But you've also got a bunch of things that you started the night before that you can get done before you open new tasks up. So you want to put some closure on something that's existing before you open something new. Because the truth is, is that we're running at about I think it's about seven to one, that there's seven new tasks for every one task that you close. So, you know, to kind of keep yourself uh, in balance, you want to have some sort of ratio between closing and opening. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and that, you mentioned digital sticky notes, and that is something that's not known to a number of the people on the webinar. Three or four people, what, what? What's a digital sticky note? Tell me more. So, okay, it's just, you know, like a regular sticky note is that post-it note, right? So right. you can um, get a digital one and you can put it anywhere on your computer. You can time it to pop up and flash on the screen. You can make it any color you want. You can move it. You can scale it. You can even put an alarm inside of it. Let me see if I can give you a reference to the uh, why do I have somebody here recommended um, an app on sticky notes that you can find on iTunes? I don't know yes. why it's on iTunes, but you can also Google digital sticky notes. 
and you'll also get some stuff popped up. Yeah, Anne um, on the webinars mentioned an app called Color Note. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think sticky notes are very familiar to Mac users because they've been around for a long time on Macs, but they're newer in other other um, computer mm -hmm. formats. So, um, mm -hmm. um, other recommendations on on from folks on the webinar: the Cozy app, C O Z I, and mm -hmm. the Wonder List. Very helpful for tasks. It's very easy to break down the steps. Well, that's something that brings me to a question that a number of people have asked, how to tackle large projects. One person mentions planning a wedding. Seems <laughs> overwhelming, which I can imagine. Um, yeah, well, you know, um, the tried and true organizing advice on this is to break it down, right? Mm -hmm. But it also helps sometimes to blow it up. <laughs> like to really, like you know, like to blow it up, go to the wall with all different kinds of sticky notes and just put everything you can possibly think of randomly on the wall of all the things that you've got to get done. Doesn't matter what categories they're in, doesn't matter the sequence, doesn't matter the priority, just blow it up. Get it all out of your head. And then you can kind of move that stuff around. And sometimes this works better physically than it does on a linear list you know, where it's harder to move things around, although you can do that uh, obviously better now with word processing. We can move chunks of information like you couldn't before on a handwritten list. But you want to give yourself something that, you know, has some flexibility. And then you'll see organically that some things are going to have to get done because they're up against a brick wall deadline of some sort. You know, you've got to book the venue, <laughs> real please, before you do almost anything else. Because you can't mess around with that. You're going to, you know, just blow the whole thing if you don't block in the, the venue first. So there's all kinds of things that are just sort of what I call brick wall things. So you want to pull out the brick wall things that are definitely going to screw up the whole event um, because they're deadline or due date or calendar-ish, have a time limit to it. And then the other stuff starts to fall organically into other big chunks. And some of those chunks can be particular people who do that thing and you give delegated to them all these different kinds of tasks or they could be just tasks that you know fall together naturally by sequence that this has to happen before that has to happen before that has to happen or they could fall together by function you know like uh, all the decorating goes, all the decorating to-dos go here, and all the stuff about invitees goes there. So there's different ways to break things down, and obviously depends on the project, and, you know, I'd be hard-pressed to delineate all kinds of projects. But the first thing I recommend is to blow it up before you break it down. Um, Christine uh, on the webinar has added a note on this. She said, I used a three-ring ring binder when planning our wedding. So yeah. I had sections for every different component, which I guess would correspond to your blowing it up. You know, she so had a section for food, for attire, for venue, for guest list, et cetera. And she says these days you might use one note or ever note um, for remembering. Yeah. And, and that's great. But, and at some point, though, when you break it down, you need the big picture again. See, that's right. the problem with breaking things down is that, you know, the organizers go out there and they advise all their clients, break it down, break it down, break it down. And then the add -er lose loses the big picture. Right? Mm -hmm. Because they're breaking it down so much. So at some point you have to kind of rebuild the big picture, sort of get get a grip on, you know, what the project is again from a from a you know a, a distance. So that's important to do both. Okay. Um, on a smaller scale, someone mentions and then then covering the wall, she uses an eighth an open paper folder. I guess there's a okay. system where you know mm -hmm. put notes throughout an open paper folder. Have you seen that? for a big project? Uh, you mean like a, a, a folio where it has a pocket I on guess, the left? Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Yeah, that's pretty good. You know, it's something that's quite tactile. Uh, you know, really, I mean, I like the binder thing, but um, it can be a little too neat for a lot of ADDers, so sometimes... A number of people folders. chimed in to say that they couldn't keep a binder organized and yeah, there was and, too much and, involved, yeah. Oh, yeah, and some people can't keep a binder simply because they're left-handed. I, I have that problem. It's really hard for me to use a binder. So um, you got to find some tools that work for you, and I know that you're all kind of like way into tools, so I don't want to overstate this because I know you like to go shopping for the organizing tool 
more than you even like to use them. <laughs> How so did you know? <laughs> How did you know that? But these folio things can be really cool because they're just two pockets, and the left pocket is the stuff that has to be done, and then you move it to the right pocket when it's done. And then you have, you know, a kind of a, a way to keep track of what you finished. It's all in one folio. You might make a folio, you know, for each aspect of the project. Right. Um, Robert chimes in to say, not to forget mind map. Mind mm -hmm. maps, which are really helpful for organizing large events from brain7.com specifically. Um, from there, okay. where again? Brain7? Brain7.com. Okay. New sites all the time. Yeah. <laughs> Leslie wants to know, what tips do you have for getting started in the morning? It's the worst time for me in settling down and sort of focusing. The morning, the morning. Well, you know, <laughs> you know, it's tough. I I'm assuming that you can't change your schedule, that you have to wake and go to work and be somewhere in the morning. Uh, that's my assumption. If you can alter that, that would be really great. You know, if you could sleep in and work later and get there at noon when you're really energetic and stay till 6 or 7 instead of leave at 5, I'm assuming you don't have that flexibility. So, um, you know, the caffeine doesn't hurt, but what I would recommend more than caffeine is protein. There is a tendency for ADDers to not feed their brain enough, hmm. particularly in the morning. They just don't. They may feed their body in certain ways, but they don't really feed their brain in that very important way that, you know, um, optimizes the energy that that protein brings to the brain. So check out some snacks that are protein uh, rich. The other thing to do is to, it sometimes also helps to have a little bit more oxygen in the morning. So if you can do breathing exercises very slowly, very simply, you know, just breathe in and you raise your arms up and you hold your breath and you breathe out really slowly, you know that exercise. Everybody knows it. Just stand outside, do that for a little while before you start in the morning. And sometimes just that infusion of oxygen can make a huge difference too. I mean, we can't alter the day a lot. So you've got to, you know, you've got to leverage every physical thing, biological thing that you can do to really give yourself a pump in the morning. The caffeine's okay, but you know you're going to crash. So, Right. Absolutely. Um, um, someone here asks, let's see, Sally, really good question. How do you realistically estimate the time required to do a task before you schedule it? I think for all of us in the ADD world, we underestimate you know, chronically how long something will take or how long it will take to get somewhere. Um, mm -hmm. right. What can you do to, to, to fix well, that? Because if you have an unrealistic schedule, then you're sort of doomed to failure before you start. I'll give you a couple of tips. One is, you know, the first thing is to just build in more time to begin with. Rather than trying to precisely estimate, just say, screw it. You know, I'm going to need 30% more time to this, everything that I plan, no matter what. And just pick a number, you know, 20%, 50%, 30% more, and allot that. Build it right in. And, you know, what's the worst that's going to happen is you're going to finish it on time, <laughs> right? Or you're going to finish it early. So just throw some extra time in there. Uh, the other thing you can do is um, minimize those distractions because that's what's really robbing you of time often. And um, try to... I have clients who really swear by alarms and timers mm -hmm. that, you know, they set alarms for different reasons. They set a timer for the amount of time that they want to stick to something, and then others set a timer for the amount of time that they want to take a break for something, and other people set a timer for, you know, checking out whether they've gone down a black hole, right? Right. So, so you can use various timers in various ways, and I'm telling you this, time is everywhere. They're on everything. They're on your computer. They're on your tablet. They're on your phone. You can buy an oven timer. They're on, your, you know, they're on your stove. They're everywhere, timers. So I think that it's a, it's a simple, old, trusty organizing tool. It's just that people tend to, you know, there's a variety of different ways to use it, and I would experiment a little bit with that. Timers really are the best. They really are great, absolutely. Yeah, um, I like Time Timer. Have you, you know about Time Timer? 
Yeah, uh, time timer is great. It actually visually shows you the amount of time that's left, right? Yeah. Um, super, super good. Um, there are a number of questions here from parents um, with Don't ADD. Don't have children. No. Whose children, <laughs> whose children also have ADD, and they, they talk about how really difficult it is to manage the household to keep the schedule going and to manage um, children who also are disorganized. Do you have any special tips for disorganized household managers? <laughs> with well, you know, the key words that you're using there is family and household. I mean, this really is a family and a household issue when one or two or more of the kids have ADD and one or two or more of the parents do too. Right. You know, you, you, this really has to be discussed and planned and plotted and schemed around as a family, as okay. a household. Uh, and that's really the most important part. And that often means that a third party gets involved in, you know, kind of facilitating this discussion. It's not impossible for the parents to have it, but, you know, It'd be great if this, this is a great time to bring in a qualified professional organizer or an ADD coach or, you know, a psychotherapist who, you know, doesn't freak out about going to people's houses or having the whole family in the, in the session at once. But it really needs to, you know, there needs to be a leader in the family, but it needs to start out as kind of a family project. I think that's fascinating that you're, um, this, Debbie, says, how can I, this is to this, in the same topic, how can I help my nine-year-old daughter keep her room organized? And I guess what you've just described is, you know, bring in someone to help the family get organized so it's not just... Yeah, it's just not you and head going at it. Right, right. no, it's a family issue. Um, yeah, we once in my household uh, found a wonderful woman named Donna Goldberg who ran something in our neighborhood called the, Pref the Organized Student. Yeah, I and know that She worked well. with Great. kids. Yeah, she worked with my daughter to help her set up her school notebooks, set up her systems when she went to high school, and then she actually came to our apartment and helped her set up the files in her room. So she, that yeah. was, you know, my one experience with what you're describing was a great success. Um, yeah, the organized, asking, the organized student nice. is a great book. By the way. Right, the organized student. She was working on rewriting it for the digital age because yeah. when last I spoke with her, she said, you know, it's so much tougher for kids nowadays because things are coming at them from blogs, from the website, from the from everything. So, yeah. um, in terms of hiring someone, lots of interest on the webinar from um, listeners in doing that. Questions include how do I find someone? How do I interview them to know that they're not going to be judgmental? Right. Um, what kinds of questions should I ask when I am um, talking yeah. to potential uh, organizer helpers? Well, um, the, there's some uh, free worksheets at the uh, challengingdisorganization.org, and that, okay. again, is on your resources list, I believe, um, for how to hire a professional organizer. Now, the challengingdisorganization.org people are professional organizers with specialties. They are the specialists in the trade, specialists in ADD, specialists in dyslexia, specialists in elder care, the specialists. There's also another group called the National Association of Professional Organizers, which are the generalists, okay? Their, their specialties are either residential or business organizing, but they don't have the specific training in those challenge areas that the ICD people have. So those are two resources, and there's a lot of free material on both of those websites. Um, ADD Friendly Ways to Organize Your Life has a lot of information about when to use a coach and how to use a coach and how a coach is different from an organizer and how an organizer is different from a therapist, and these are important roles to get straight uh, in your whole treatment plan. Um, and then uh, for coaches, addcoaches.com I think is the going gold standard. Okay. There's a question here. Where are the resources list that Judith is mentioning? Are those on the screen here? I think they are. They're not. Um, I think yes. they're on the resources page. Okay. Um, now, a lot of this stuff is also in the era of endless book. It's called Getting Organized in the Era of Endless, and you get 10% off on that, as well as the ADD Friendly book you get 10% off on. And you'll see that deal. Susan will, will tell you about that later. Okay, and that's on the uh, squallpress.net site? Yeah. I assume, okay. 
Um, question, is Judith going to address the clutter issue? Oh, clutter, <laughs> I clutter, told clutter. you that clutter was going to be a very important topic for... Yeah, oh, okay, so um, let's see. So there's a lot of clutter coming, and there's a lot of clutter out there, and part of it is because clutter is more durable than it ever was before. You know, the stuff we have doesn't break down like our uh, glass and paper and plastic and so forth that were recyclables of days uh, long gone. So there's this whole, you know, bunch of clutter that's technology clutter and devices and you know, this sort of uh, museum to our march through modernity, if you will, you know, of stuff that just gets obsolete really quickly. So there's a couple of things I just want to say about that kind of clutter, which is that um, I find it helpful for somebody in every family to be the device captain. And that's the person who, you know, syncs the devices, researches the latest version, uh, does the patches, make sure it gets recycled um, properly, uh, sells it if that's appropriate, keeps the money if they like. But there needs to be somebody who's sort of in charge of these devices in the house. Keep track of the cords, get them labeled, that kind of thing. Um, the other kind of clutter, of course, is just that, you know, that stuff that you're keeping around is visual cues. And that makes sense and it actually works, which is why people are doing it. So we don't want to take that away from ADDers, that, those visual cues, those, you know, otherwise it would be out of sight, out of mind. I get that. But just be open-minded to the fact that um, two things. One is that everything that's out as clutter can still be purged occasionally. You can still go through it occasionally and get rid of the stuff that's obsolete. I don't think that I'm saying that you shouldn't have things out visually. I'm just saying that you should review it every now and then. Just make an appointment with yourself to review it. And this is a good thing to bring a body double in or a friend or a buddy to do that with so that you're just managing it and it doesn't get overwhelming. The other thing about clutter is to practice, you know, some kind of in and out ratio. So if you bring in two pairs of shoes and you got to get rid of one. If you bring in three pairs of shoes and you got to get rid of two. Some kind of ratio of in and out for things. I know somebody who's just, you know, she just has all kinds of office supply stuff. She's always buying file folders and post-it notes and, you know, just labels and all kinds of things you could possibly think of to get her organized in her office, but she never gets rid of anything. And so, you know, she, first of all, she doesn't know what she has. And second of all, she's buying redundantly. She's spending money on some stuff that she already has. But if you practice this ratio... Um, then things will go out and there'll be a little bit more flow because that's what you're going for. You're going for when, where there's clutter, there's no flow, right? It's like being constipated. So you got to do some stuff that kind of gets things flowing. And this appointment with yourself to review your clutter is one way to get things flowing. And also an in-out ratio is another way to get things flowing. So, you know, I hate to, I don't want to overplay that image because it can get disgusting, but you get the idea. So those are, those are some things. Um, nothing, you know, uh, stops clutter better than stopping it at the source. So whatever that source is, if you're a, a thrift store person or you like freebies or you go to yard sales or you can't resist a sale, you know, the first thing you're grown-ups here, the first thing, of course, is to shake hands with the fact that these are your vulnerabilities. And if they're your vulnerabilities, you want to try to do some stuff that um, stops the things from getting in your house in the first place. And one of those tips is just keeping your hands in your pocket when you go to these places. <laughs> because there is a connection between touching it and buying it, touching it and, and wanting to have it. But if you use your eyeballs a little bit more and keep your hands in your pocket, again, this is a very simple trick. I don't want to overstate the power of it. You know, that's not possible to do. Um, we all do this for different reasons, gather clutter and fail to discard it. Um, but anyway, those are some of the tips off the top of my head. Those are great tips. Um, um, 
Here's Dan Lin who says, my biggest problem is finding motivation to do something when I know I'll just have to do it again and again, i.e. cleaning the house or doing laundry. So boring because I know it'll just keep on having to be done over and over again. So I put it off. Yeah. <laughs> Any thoughts on, on the boring tasks of daily life, household life work? Well, you know, if Dan is privileged enough to be able to afford someone else to do those kinds of tasks, that's one way out of it. You know, to like really be really very choosy, but pay someone else to do the things that just bore you to death, that are routine, that someone else can learn, that don't cost a lot for another person to be paid or traded out with or whatever. You really want to try to get some of that stuff out of your life and onto somebody else's plate if you possibly have that privilege. You may not. But those, those kinds of things yell, delegate, delegate, delegate to me. If you can, if it, if it's possible at all to do that, right. if it's not possible at all to do that, then you know, I don't know, take your clothes off and do it. I mean, you know, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Music, right? You know, there is this Peter Pan thing where people, uh, you know, kind of want things to be exciting and interesting all of their grown-up life, and it's just not going to happen. So we have to come to terms with, like, taxes are just like incredibly boring to me. But you know, somebody's got to do it. Paying bills, somebody's got to do it. Getting the house clean, somebody's got to do it. It doesn't have to be you. It might be you, you could, you know, trade that out or pay somebody else to do it. I do a lot of trading. Interesting. Yeah. Um, Alyssa says, managing the mail is really difficult for me. The pal just grows and grows. Mostly things that need to be recycled, but I just can't bring myself to do it. Do you have specific suggestions or processes for managing the endless paper that flows into my house? Oh, let's see. What is this statistic now? We get more mail in one day than our parents got in a, a month, and more mail in one month than our grandparents got in a year. Wow. And, that's with, and that's with the Internet. Okay. You know, that's with email. You know, so, so it's still pretty formidable. Um, there are these um, services that will call your, you know, junk mail, and they'll go and uh, uh, make sure that you get off of the computerized list. I think it's called directmarketing.com has a, a, a service and a process for that. That's good because that kind of speaks to what I was talking about before, about cutting it off at the source. Now, once it comes in there, uh, let's see. I just don't want to give you old advice that I know you're already following and it's failing. I'm trying to think of something that's new. <sighs> something that's new for mail. Can't burn it. <laughs> Schedule it? Schedule a day to get rid of it? I don't know. Well, you know, mail is kind of that. I mean, you have to do the mail at least twice a week. If you can't do it daily, loosen up on yourself. But don't do it monthly because then you're paying late fees for bills. But if you can do it twice a week, that can usually manage the inflow so that you don't get overwhelmed with it. The other thing, of course, is to have only one place for it to land, which is frequently the dining room table, so that at least you know that it's all in one spot. And the other thing to do is to not open it. In other words, if you're going through the mail and it's third-class mail, what we call junk mail, don't open the junk mail. Because inside of most junk mail is four to seven pieces, you know, coupons and offers and return envelopes and all kinds of stuff that sort of jumps out of that envelope. So what you want to do is really look at the envelope. And if it's a, if it's a solicitation for a credit card and you're not in the market for a credit card right now, you're fine with your credit cards, thank you very much, don't even open it. So right. that's, that's, some of, that's some of what's happening. There are a couple of tips here that people have chimed in. At, as we've been discussing mail, one person says, don't even look at it. Just throw it away immediately. No, and then Lori says, I have a recycle cart right next to the mailbox, and just yeah. junk mail just goes right in, into it. So, good, um, good. I like that. Yeah. I, mean, I, think I once designed a, a recycling bin that fit on mailboxes so that people wow. wouldn't even have to go further than their front yard. <laughs> and they could throw it in the recycling bin. But the post That's office great. Yeah. 
<laughs> really fascinating. And there's another tip here. This is great. People are chiming in with really helpful, uh, helpful yeah. thoughts. Melinda, yeah. who says, I leave my wallet in the car if I'm window right. shopping and don't carry a basket or push a shopping cart when I go in for a few items. So, and I also avoid Walmart. So there is someone who's trying to follow your advice of not yeah. bringing things in. Wow, pretty yeah. impressive. Um, question here, how do you stay on task when you're on the computer and there are so many other things and other sites that lure you? Um, that's Renee. Yeah, um, it's called serendipitous information. <laughs> you know, it's that information that, you know, I had a client, for instance, who was um, researching a new laptop. She was trying to decide between a laptop and a tablet. And it took her everywhere. She went to ergonomic sites. She went to the airline sites about how you get your bags through on the airlines. I mean, she just was all over the Internet and barely got the core research done because she was so attracted to all of this other information. And the truth is, is that that information is very attractive. You know, but if we pursued everything that we were attracted to, like people, for instance, we'd never have you know, that loving primary relationship that we have. So you have to find a place to offload serendipity, lucky, tangent, tangential, but interesting information. And a great place to offload that to is a list or to Evernote or, you know, take a picture of it or write down the website or just get it captured and out of the mainstream of what you're looking at so that you know that you still have it somewhere but it isn't kind of an obstacle for you going forward with whatever it is that you're looking for. Um, it's a question here from uh, Trisha who wants to know whether you'll explain what a body double is. I think you mentioned I it. will if you insist. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've only got, Susan, this is your call because there's only three more minutes. Yeah, that, I think this is a good way to end because it's it's one of your key tenets which, and a helpful one, I think. Okay, so a body double. Someone there, is, yeah. Help you. It's somebody who's present and passive with you, who isn't organizing with you, isn't organizing for you, might not even be giving you organizing advice. In fact, they may be doing a whole other activity while you're organizing. They may be balancing their checkbook, they may be on, you know, on the computer, but they're there and they're present and they have this passive uh, presence that kind of anchors you to the task at hand and um, just provides this environment in which you focus on getting organized. They use this a lot in school. They use it a lot in, you know, ADD treatment plans. There's a lot of literature on body double at that um, challengingdisorganization.org site. And in all of my books, I think, has it. Okay. Judith, thank you so much. This was super helpful, and we really appreciate all your tips. Folks, please check out Judith's websites that we mentioned. She is really an organizer who understands ADD. It's a very different kind of organization. And again, it's fileheads.net and squallpress.net. So thank you again, everyone. And thank you so much, Judith. For more Attitude podcast and information on living well with attention deficit, visit attitudemag.com. That's A-D-D-I-T-U-D-E-M-A-G.com.